Welcome to the Prophetic Picture. My name is Mike Avalon, and this is my friend Shabazz. Shabazz, I am so excited about this program today because we're going to talk about Islam and Bible prophecy. And our last program, we went through the, the the lineage and the history of Abraham all the way down, and now we're going to pick it up and we're going to look at it from a prophetic angle. And I think this is very interesting because the world is actually looking at prophecy right now as we see the um, the conflicts that are going on in the world and the unrest. Um, you, you put your finger on any spot in the world and there's unrest. But the world is looking at the East and seeing how things are going down. And so today's program is going to be very um, insightful for us to be able to see what is it that prophecy really says about this subject today. Yeah, absolutely true. And, you know, Revelation's prophetic picture of Islam is probably one of the uh, most significant studies we can have during mm. these sessions that we are together here. And um, it, will, it will give us a concise look at what God has to say what about this movement, about mm. Islam. You know, now let's face it, 1.5 billion people in the world are Muslims. And, you can't ignore uh, it. No, you can't ignore it. And God has spoken to that in the Bible. You know, I've had many Muslim friends say mm-hmm. that, you know, the Quran, the Bible talks about Islam and the Bible mm-hmm. has predicted Islam. Mm-hmm. You know, in, in, in some ways I have to agree with them, but it's only in the book of Revelation that we hear anything about Islam yeah. and specifically in chapter nine of uh, the book of Revelation. That's right. And, um, and there are, uh, there are several trumpets in the book of Revelation mm-hmm. that, that, that speak about different events that lead up to this final great event of Jesus' second coming. But those, those trumpets, why don't you give us a little synopsis of these trumpets mm-hmm. and what the Bible says in, 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 in the book of Revelation? Well, first of all, it's important to note that we are both historicists when it comes to the understanding of the prophetic uh, book of Revelation. And, and Daniel also, and all the other prophetic minor uh, prophets. And, and so when we look, when we look at um, the seven trumpets, there's seven of them, and, and what happens with, during the seven trumpets, um, there is a process of what's happening to Rome. And I'm going to look at that in a, or look at that in a second. So if we just go to Revelation real quick here, and let's just look at this real quick so we have a, a foundation of where we're going. And we look at Revelation 8, and in the seventh chapter, it talks, it talks extensively about, um, about the first trumpet being blown. And, and we don't have time to go into all the details today, but just to give us a foundation, um, the first trumpet is Alaric, the Goth. And as we look at this, every trumpet that's being blown, it's chipping away at the Roman power. It's chip, chip away. And the next trumpet is uh, Alaric, the, the Vandal, and then Attila the Hun. And we're going to go back and talk about Attila the Hun because it's something very specific that we'll be talking about about him later in the program. And then in verse 12, it talks about um, the Heruli. So we have the Ostrogoths, we have the Vandals, the, um, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, the Huns, and the Heruli, and they're chipping away at, at Rome. But then something changes. And what does that change? We got, we got trumpets, we got five trumpets, and now something, or four trumpets, and also we got something that's really radical that happens. That's right. And it's called the three woes. That's right. So now we have trumpets and woes. And that's, those are, that coincides with the last three trumpets. That's right. And so we're going to talk about these three woes. Pretty much we're going to be focusing on, on the first woe today. That's right. That's right. And, and so the, so the seven, the, the, these trumpets, are blown successively one mm-hmm. after the other right and and there's an angel assigned to each trumpet and they when they blow the trumpet a great event takes place mm-hmm. and each event deals with the chipping away of the roman empire the pagan roman empire and the eventually pagan, the, mm-hmm. it leads into the paper roman empire which is being chipped away and we'll see clear down to through the through the through the to the line of history mm-hmm. And prophetically, we see that it brings us all the way clear to the time of Christ's return, His That's second right. coming, and and the, the judgment of the world. I mean, mm-hmm. the end of the world. And and as you you mentioned, we want to specifically pay a focus on this the fifth trumpet, 
and the first woe because that's the right. fifth trumpet has a woe, has a woe and that's it. the first woe. Mm-hmm. And then we have the sixth trumpet with the, si- the, the second woe. And then we have the seventh trumpet, w- the which has woe. the third woe. Which is the final one. That's yeah. right. And, and I want to submit to our viewers that, uh, that the fifth and the sixth trumpet deal with Islam, mm-hmm. specifically deal with Islam. The, the rise of Islam and the consequent uh, uh, progression of Islam and it's it's expansionism in the world mm-hmm. and and ultimately we go on, we come to the sixth trumpet dealing with the rise of islam to, uh, through this uh, the 13th century you know dealing with the ottoman empire mm-hmm. and and so on but specifically today we want to talk about the rise of islam as it was predicted in the bible and that is significant that is very significant because this will help our viewers to see the 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 accuracy of the Bible and where we are in time and where we are in how time how close we are to the second coming absolutely we are, and and th- th- this is a fascinating study I'm excited about it so, so well, I would like to just perhaps maybe read the the verses that coincide with uh, the uh, the fifth trumpet okay and let me just scroll down here on my uh, right there and I will start over here this is chapter nine. I'm going to read the very, uh, the very first 12 verses that deal with the fifth trumpet. Okay. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the reason of the smoke of the pit. And uh, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion." When he striketh a man, and in those days shall men seek death, and death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of these locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were the, as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as it as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Hmm. Pretty intense, isn't it? Very intense. Yeah. <laughs> and um, don't no really call it a woe. <laughs> yeah. And it, and the the text continues. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there was stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, one woe is past. And behold, there come two woe more hereafter. Mm. So we just look a, a quick rundown on the first 12 verses of, uh, that, of Revelation chapter 9. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot going on there. A lot of, there's a yeah. whole bunch going on there. I mean, and all of it is symbolic. Our viewers must understand and take this into consideration that as that I know most of them are aware that the book of Revelation is a, is a symbolic book, mm-hmm. but that, but that the Bible defines its own interpretation. It gives us its own meaning of these, this, these texts. And we don't have to look anywhere else to find out what this, the Bible is teaching. Mm-hmm. And one of the principles of understanding prophecy is that when something seems abstract, you know, it's, it's prophetic. If something seems literal, then you can take it literal. In this case, there's a lot of abstract stuff Absolutely. going on here. A lot of symbolism. A and, lot of symbolism. And, and here's a breakdown on the, of what we just read. Uh, a star falls to the earth. Mm. The, the, as the start of the text, a star falls to, falls to the earth. Number two, uh, the star has the key to the bottomless pit. Number mm-hmm. three, uh, it says that um, there was a king over the abyss who was a destroyer. Right. That's very interesting. We'll talk about that later. Mm-hmm. Number four, the king opened the abyss and smoke came out, which brought darkness upon the land. Number five, locusts came out of the smoke whose shapes was like horses prepared for battle. And number six, these locusts were to hurt men five, five months. months. And that's significant. We'll talk more uh, about that later too as well. And number seven, the special attacks were to be against 
those who had not the seal of God against apostasy, then this, this is, this must be a clearly comprehended that, that this particular woe mm-hmm. is focused against not the entire uh, population of the earth, though it is a global movement, mm-hmm. yet it is it is targeting people who do not have the seal of God. And really, wow. we need to talk about the seal of God as well mm-hmm. to to clarify what does the Bible ta- what mean when it talks about the seal of God. Okay. When we get to that question, we'll deal with it. Um, and uh, but meanwhile, we need to continue and and just look at some of this symbology here and and decipher from the Bible what the, these symbologies, these symbols mean. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the prophecy, Michael, uh, commences with a star that falls to the earth. That's what the Bible says. That's right. Revelation 9, 1. And, it, and um, once again, I read that text. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall mm. from heaven onto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Hmm. Now the question I'm sure most people are asking, what does a star mean? What does that represent? What does it mean? I mean, uh, well, a lot of people immediately when they hear the, the word star, they think angels. You know, we talked in our last program about the, the, the star that led the wise men. We never actually said what that star was. It was the host of heaven, as we know later on, because all of a sudden the sky splits open and all the angels start singing and, and, and praising God that a Messiah has come. Um, but a star doesn't always necessarily mean an angel. No. Now it's interesting though. The word angel is 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 angelos, which means messenger. That's right. And so, a message can be brought by an angel. A message can be brought brought by a man. And it can also be brought by God Himself. That's right. So we have to be careful. We have to read when we read star or we read angel. We got to make sure we read it in context to be to make sure that we know what it's talking about, not just leaping to of logic, making leaps of logic and trying to figure it out by not studying line upon line, precept upon precept, Isaiah twenty eight, verse nine and onwards. It repeats it over and over again that we have to look at the great preponderance of truth. That's right. And and then draw our conclusions from that. Well, so. You know, we see that happening in the Bible that, that, that in, in some cases, God himself brings a message. Mm-hmm. In some instances, we see angels bringing messages. And mm-hmm. in, in many instances, we see chosen men that are messengers of God that, that bring a message from the Lord, mm-hmm. such as his prophets or the apostles and the disciples That's right. of God. And, and we see that that, that, that is absolutely crucial. In, in, in Daniel 12, it says that, that those that are, that are faithful and true, they will shine as the brightness of the firmament as the stars That's forever right. and ever. Amen. So here's a, another, um, Connect. Oh, yeah. And also Jude. We're going to talk about that. We talk about that as well. Well, uh, uh, as you said, a star could represent a spiritual leader. Yeah. And we see those that happen in Revelation chapter one, verse 20 and Daniel eight ten. Yeah. We have examples of that where, where a, a spiritual leader was ca- called a star. Yeah. We also have uh, where the Bible says angels, uh, Revelation again, Revelation one twenty and mm-hmm. 12, 4. And also Job chapter 38, verse 7 talks about angels being stars. Mm-hmm. And we also have uh, Jude 13, as you mentioned, where false leaders or spiritual, whether they're spiritual or political, but false leaders are also called stars. Yeah, they are, according to Jude. Yeah. So, so we have a, a wide array of, of Lucifer's called a, a star. He, he, Jesus that, talks about he saw Satan fall from heaven like Absolutely. A, like so lightning. this is like lightning. Um, this is interesting. That's right. And in, in, in Revelation 12, 7, it talks about the dragon being, mm-hmm. that's Satan, yeah. drew a third of all the, 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 the stars down with him. Mm-hmm. And those are the hosts of heaven, the that's angels. Right. A third mm-hmm. of them were drawn down with his tail. He mm-hmm. deceived them. So, so we, we see that a star could have a, a, a many different definitions, but it's always a messenger. Always. Whether it's an angel or not, and it could be a false messenger as well. Mm-hmm. So it says that the star fell onto the earth and, uh, well, let's find out what earth denotes in this particular context, you know, uh, looking at it from the angle that we are looking, you know, because it says that it fell upon the earth. Mm-hmm. It doesn't give a specific geographical location where it fell. It just says it fell onto the earth. Hmm. So this denotes a global movement not just a, a, a regional one, not just a local movement, but not uh, limited to a bo- borders, but right. it's a global 
worldwide movement. Mm -hmm. Something happens worldwide. Now, if it was a geographical location on the earth, it would be very specific That's about right. that. And since it's not, but there is, a, there is a text that talks about it being geographically located, the star that falls. The yes. star that falls. Yes. And we were talking about Attila the Hun. And in that, ap in that episode, the star falls, but it falls on what? If so, on the rivers. Yeah. And, and let's, let's, for the sake of the viewers, clarify something here. As you mentioned, Attila, that's in uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse right. 10. And that's talking about uh, the third, it's the third trumpet. That's right. And he's talking about one of those trumpets that was a, a chipping away the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. Attila, the king of the Huns, was a barbarian. He was mm -hmm. a vicious king. Oh yeah. The the, bar, the 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 Huns they attacked the Roman Empire from the east, but coming through this through the current Russia, mm -hmm. they, moved they moved westward and, then down. and they came yeah. down. And anything in their path was destroyed. Anything no in their path, no mercy. Mm -hmm. And it was a local movement because the Bible says, "I saw a star fall to the earth, mm -hmm. unto the rivers." Yeah. At this point, it just says unto the. It gives us a direction saying that it's a local. Geographical application, application mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not a global application. This star, however, in Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, the fifth trumpet star has a worldwide application, a global application, and which is, which is incredible because we see the accuracy of the Bible once again. You know, most expositors all agree. I mean, most of them all agree about Attila the Hun. That's right. As, as, what that star application represents. Yeah, exactly. But when all of a sudden we move into the first woe, all of a sudden some people take leaps of logic and try to get out of that. And it's like, the Bible's not confusing like that. No. What, what God builds um, in one place, all, he doesn't just go flip it. No. No. And so these, this is a principles of understanding prophecy are very important that we follow them. I think we're going to tackle that issue in just a few moments right. about, uh, about the, this, this two, uh, different views of okay. Attila and all that that Very you brought good. up. Absolutely. And um, so in this context, again, it's the earth. And so, but the, the big question, hmm. bigger than what a star represents and what <laughs> earth represents is, yeah. who is this star? Oh, That's the biggest question. That's the, that's the, the question of the century probably. And, and who is this star? And let's look at it as we dig into the Bible, as we look at, let, let the verses talk. And, and you know, mm. my, I don't know if it's been your experience and it's been mine and I'm sure you've had that same experience. When, when you ask people who this star is, the very first person they say, who is that person? <laughs> um, Lucifer. And then, and then he became Satan and he fell. Yeah. They say it Satan. Good, you know, on, on surface, when you look at the surface, it's like, it's an easy one to draw to. Um, but we have to be careful. Again, that we look at the the context of of the verse, and you, you, you really, especially the time it's it's happening. That's right, and you can blame, really can blame the people for thinking because yeah. the language implies could imply that it is Satan, but the context doesn't. And as we open yeah. up the, the 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 text more and more, we see that it's not talking about Satan. Mm -hmm. Especially as we get a little bit uh, towards the other verses here. Let me okay. let's continue a little bit here, and we'll see um, one of the reasons that it doesn't fit Satan as the character that mm -hmm. fell. It says the star fell from heaven onto the earth. Mm -hmm. Is that the book of Revelation is is a prophetic book. When 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 Moses when when John wrote the book, mm -hmm. was he looking back or forward? Well in in Revelation one it says it it tells Jesus makes it very clear that these prophecies are going to begin right now. Don't, don't look sometime way off into the future like some of the futuristic um, interpretations do. They say they put things way off into the future. Some of them put way back in the past. No, he says it's happening right now. Right. And, and so when did Lucifer fall? He, flew, he fell way back in here the beginning at the creation. beginning. And, but here is something happening well, yeah, John is, toward the end of toward John the is end making of a prophetic statement here mm -hmm. about an event that had not yet taken place or transpired. Right, it's a prophecy. And many people take Satan's fall and put it right here in Revelation chapter 9 mm -hmm. and say, this is Satan's fall that's been talked about. But in, in Revelation 12, it does talk about Satan, but it, it, it tells when it happened. That's right. It, it, it that's puts right. it in its right place. Mm -hmm. With this, it doesn't. And, it's, it's, and, and even the tense in Revelation chapter 12 
is a past tense, talking yeah. about Satan withdrawing the, his tail. Right. So Satan's fall took place before the creation of this world. And we know that biblically. And Jesus himself in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, he said, what did he say? He said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. There you are. Yep. And that's past tense. Mm -hmm. Why, how did Jesus behold this? Was he there? No, he sees this. But was he there when, no. in, when Satan well, fell? Well, of course he was there. Of course he was there. Yeah. And, and I'm saying this for the benefit of some of our viewers who are probably not, uh, that, that are not familiar with, with mm -hmm. Christian teachings and doctrines that, that, that put Christ in the same level as humans and say, well, Christ uh, had a point where uh, he was born. But mm -hmm. Jesus is the one who kicked him out of heaven. <laughs> of course, that's Michael the archangel. That's right. And there's this great battle that takes And place. Jesus says, I was there. I beheld him fall to the earth. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, Christ just clarifies that for us. And mm -hmm. so uh, I'm, uh, I, I have no doubt in who Jesus is. And I, mm -hmm. I, and I would invite all of our viewers to, that have not known Christ in a way that they should perhaps, mm -hmm. that to, to look at the text, look at the scriptures, read them and study them and get more familiar with Jesus and understand who Jesus really is. But when Jesus was in the flesh, he's looking back at that, Absolutely. At that, at ev that event. In this event in Luke, he's looking back and saying, I beheld, yeah. I saw it, I was there. Mm -hmm. I saw him fall to the earth. Yeah. Back to Revelation 9 verse one, and it says, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit now, we're still talking about Satan here. Was Sa Remember in, in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, mm -hmm. an angel comes down and bounds Satan towards the end of the yeah. world, right? Towards the end of the world's history, Satan is bound for a thousand years. For a thousand years. years. He's bound in chains and thrown into the pit. Mm -hmm. And we know those chains as circumstance. That's right. That's right. He has no but, one to tempt, so I mean, it's, no, it's, figuratively, yeah. it's like it's being a, chained up. Those chains yeah. are figurative. Yeah. But he's bound for a thousand years. Right. Now, was he ever given the keys to, those, to, the, to, to the chains? Well, that's kind of ludicrous. Wouldn't it be? Yeah. <laughs> imagine, I, I, imagine I break the law. Uh -huh. they, they arrest me and put me, the sheriff puts me into, in, in prison. Yeah, I, and I, said, I, by here's the way, the here's the key. <laughs> And the bathrooms are on the corner there. <laughs> and, and, and I am, uh, I'm, uh -huh. I'm, hey, I got the keys, man. Wait till he falls asleep. It doesn't even make sense. <laughs> no. So this star falling to uh -huh. the earth and the keys given to him and, and falling to the bottomless, opening the bottomless pit. Right. No, Satan is bound in the bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. But this star is given the keys to the bottomless pit. Oh, there's a big difference. Big difference. Big difference. And, uh, uh, and, um, let me, let me just read that text and the, those three verses in Revelation 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven. This is in regards respect to Satan being bound for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. This angel had a key, key of the bottomless pit and a great chain. Remember, notice this angel did not fall. It says, I saw an angel come down from heaven. Mm -hmm. the, in Revelation 9, 1, it says, I saw an angel fall to the earth from heaven. Mm -hmm. It says, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. Yeah. Does it say anything about giving him a key? No. No, nothing at all. So, um, we are, uh, this is, so we can, we can and again, conclude. this event takes later on. Absolutely, and it's a, it's a, the Revelation nine one is a, it's a future event mm -hmm. in perspective to where John was standing. That's right. In in first first uh, century A.D. Mm -hmm. um, so it's clear that we, Satan is not the character spoken of in Revelation chapter nine verse one. Well, if this Satan, if this star is not Satan, who is it? Hmm. You know, now here's the other, here's the second million dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not Satan, who is it? Well, Mike, as you know, and I know, there are at least two opinions out there today mm -hmm. uh, to the identity of this star. Yeah. And we, we, I think it would be fair that we kind of mention both of them mm -hmm. and then make a conclusion. Okay. But before we do that, I want the viewers to know that this is this subject is not a salvation issue. We're not to squabble and over over this. Um, this is a something for us to look at, but we shouldn't divide over it. Um, so as we talk about this, just take the information, study it for yourself, and then draw your conclusion. That's right. 
And hopefully your conclusion will be a biblical one. I mean, yes. in the sense that what the Bible is saying. Or tradition, and, don't and go by understand, tradition. And understand, you know, you know um, because at the end, well, well, when it all is said and done, we want all to be on the right side, on Amen. Christ's side. Amen. That's where we want to be. Right. So there are two different schools of thoughts here. Mm -hmm. And the very first one, interestingly, is that a lot of Christian theologians, modern theologians and some from the past, believe that it was Muhammad, the yep. prophet of Islam. Mm -hmm. Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, is the star that fell from heaven to the earth. Well, there's a problem with that already. Yes. You, you and I don't agree with that. We don't agree with that. No. And, and the reason why, the reason, if you don't mind me saying this now, yeah, I think we need to hit it right on, is that to say he was a star that fell from heaven, you would have to say that, a lot of them think, actually they're saying this, is that at a time, Muhammad was a Christian, and he fell from grace. And, and started something different. Yes. The, and that, so that, is this, the, that is that is what they're saying. That is what they, they believe based because the uh, because the word heaven mm -hmm. in Revelation chapter nine verse one, uh, the original Greek meaning has several meanings: expansion, heaven, sky, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the abode of God, and the, the the minor meanings at the bottom of the list are Christianity, gospel. Yeah. So they take these last meanings that are the, the, the weak. weakest. Yeah, they're weak. In the and they apply it to the character of this star and say, well, see, that must be, then it must be somebody who used to be a Christian and fell from grace. Mm -hmm. and Muhammad is the one that fits that, they say. But there is no history no, that backs that up. Absolutely not. And it's, and it's not, it doesn't follow biblical harmonetics either because, because the third trumpet has another star that falls to the earth and mm -hmm. all Christian theologians, both in, in the, in the, in the 18th, 19th century mm. and 20th century. And now in the 21st century, the majority of Christian theologians agree that the, that the star that fell in, the, in, in, in uh, Revelation chapter eight, the third yeah. trumpet right. was Attila, the king of the Huns that we yeah. already mentioned. Right. And he, mm -hmm. it says that he also fell from heaven, mm -hmm. but there they don't apply the harmonetics <laughs> accurately because there they say it doesn't mean heaven uh, in, in a sense of gospel Christianity, but it's the same word, but it's the same word. And if you're going to follow the biblical harmonetics, we must, be the text has to be consistently agreeing with each other. Mm -hmm. You cannot move away from it. Right. So, so it can't be the prophet Muhammad in this sense, although not revelation nine talks about Islam, sure. something else gives way to the rise of Islam. There you go. Something That's and in, someone else. Mm -hmm. And, um, what is the second person? King Kusra. Kusra. King Kusra of Persia. Mm -hmm. He was a contemporary of Muhammad. And he lived during the exact same time that Muhammad was alive. And mm -hmm. we'll talk about, and this may sound, uh, what, uh, what do they mean by a, a Persian king gave rise to the Islam? No, he didn't start Islam. No. He was not, a, 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 he was not responsible for the start of Islam, but series of events transpired dealing with him and his empire that consequently gave way mm -hmm. to the Muslim expansionism. Okay, for, for example, I have, a, I have a tree. I have trees on my property. And um, one of the trees I had to cut down because it was dead. And it was full of bugs and everything. And when I cut it down, I had, a, I had a, a tree specialist come, an arborist come, and he, he looked at it and found out, trying to figure out what happened to make that tree die, and we found mold in it. Yes. When, when something is starting to implode or decay or whatever, then all of a sudden, the animal kingdom realizes something's weak and they attack it. Yes. And we see that in the, even in, as far as animals go, we see that happen. And so here, um, Kustro, he's, something's happening to him. His kingdom is starting to fall apart and all of a sudden someone takes advantage of this kingdom starting to solidify. That's right. And, and, and this is where all of a sudden the transition takes place. That's right. And, and, and that, that's, you led us exactly to where we need to go because it, that's what we're talking about at this point. And, and, and Husro, it was exactly that, that link in a sense that gave way to the, to the expansionism, not to the rise of Islam, no. to the expansion of Islam. And, right. and let's look at that right now in detail. Um, and let me just scroll down because I'm going to, uh, I have a lot here to share. 
um, we covered some of these things. We were talking about the king of Attila and mm -hmm. we were talking about um, the prophecy of the, 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 the third trumpet and Attila being the star that fell to the earth, the connection there with uh, the star that fell in Revelation chapter nine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, during the, uh, another thing that I want to say during the, f during the first phase of Muhammad's ministry on earth, he was new on the scene. Uh, the, the, the scene of, uh, he was new on the scene of action. He was an obscure prophet. He was mm -hmm. not very well known or were, very well liked. And mm -hmm. if they, and, and, and just not very famous His at that time. His following was very small. Very right? small yeah. following. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, so he could not have been this, in that sense also, could not have been that star that fell to the earth. Mm -hmm. And, um, but as we said, something else happened to, that gave rise to the birth of the Saracens. And uh, King Khusro came on the scene just around the same time that Muhammad was on the scene. Uh, in fact, there were two empires that stood as barriers against the expansion of Islam from the south to the northeast and to the northwest. Hmm. Look, the entire Arab Peninsula, you know, uh, south of modern day uh, uh, Turkey, right, and all of the all uh, and west of uh, modern day Iran and east of North Africa, down all the way to 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 the to the to the uh, Red Sea and and all of that was Arab. Mm -hmm. All of that was already in, under the control of the of the Saracens. And the Saracens were the very first Arab movement, and but King Husro to the east, northeast of the of the Arab Peninsula, and uh, Heraclius, the Roman Empire to the yeah. west. These two powers kept the Islamic forces from expanding. But something happened in history that gave way to the rise of Islam hmm. and their expansionism. See these two kingdoms. These two empires, like the Romans dam. and the Persians, yeah. were bitter enemies. Yeah. And they were ba battling it out all the time. And it wasn't until around 630, somewhere around there, 629, 630, at the, at the Battle of Nineveh, there when, when uh, the Persians lost 50 of their standards to mm -hmm. the Romans. With their army well nigh defeated and annihilated, the Persians had to retreat, retreat but even then they were overcome. Hmm. And the Romans, in their though the Romans were a little bit weaker, they they managed in this battle to to basically defeat the Persians. But the Romans, in the process of defeating the Persians, lost their own strength and vitality. Mm -hmm. By the time the battle was over and the Persians were defeated, the Romans had been reduced to a small, small, small uh, force. Right. And so what happens is that there was a vacuum that was created. A vacuum. And it had to be filled, right? That's right. <laughs> so, and and what that what happened was that before before the Saracens went after the Romans, mm -hmm. they saw that the Persians were completely gone. Yeah. They went right in. They went right in into Persia, and uh, Khusro uh, basically was assassinated by his own generals. Mm -hmm. He lost his life, and at this point, the new a new monarch was put in place. However. The, uh, be as it may, the new monarch with all his effort was not able to withstand the Saracen invasion. Hmm. And they basically in a short time uh, took the entire uh, Persian empire over. And it was the defeat of Khusro that was the key in the hands of the Muslims to expand. That is the key that the Bible is talking about in Revelation chapter 9. And the history fits Exactly perfect. Uh, it fits it. Absolutely. And then later on in, 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 the, um, in the, the second woe, we see a time prophecy that literally falls exactly right on time, absolutely. which proves that everything before it, it was, it was on timing. The that's timing right. was right. And so that's very interesting. And we'll talk about that. Sometime. That's right. We, uh, and so we, we, let's continue a little bit here more. And we still have some time left to, to finish this as uh, and um, so let me talk about Muhammad and Khosrow being contemporaries. They lived mm -hmm. around the same time, and um, you know uh, we don't know when King Khosrow was born. We don't know the, mm. the date of birth for him. However, we know that he became king in 590 A.D. Muhammad was born in 570 A.D. and 
610, when Muhammad was 20 years old, Khosrow became king. Hmm. 610 AD, Muhammad is 40 years old. At this time, he has his first vision. He now has become officially the prophet of Islam. And in 628 AD, Khosrow is assassinated. He dies. And, and Muhammad's death happens in 632 AD when he was only 62 years old. So this is a timeline that that is that is that is important because they were contemporaries, right? And that that's another evidence of um, the fact that Khosrow was the key that opened the way for the Muslims to expand mm -hmm. and move all over the world. Basically, they won. They 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 the expansion eventually led all over all the way to India, and then on on the west they went all the way no, all of North Africa and parts of uh, the Central Africa and into Southern Europe, uh, uh, Portugal, Spain. Yeah. Even in Portugal and Spain, they still have mosques. Yeah. They still have mosques, that, but converted to, to churches, of course, mm -hmm. because the Europeans later on took back the territories from them. Um, Very interesting. Yes. And uh, so, uh, so the Saracen expansionism started in 630 mm -hmm. until 632 AD. And, uh, and again, it was shortly after the fall of the Persian king. And we know that accor by, uh, according to historians that up to 632 AD, Persians were Zoroastrians. They worshipped fire. Mm -hmm. And after that, suddenly there's a change in the a shift in the religious views and they become Muslims. Because the Saracens forced them to convert. You know, they told them if they don't, they will be killed. Mm -hmm. Um, so now, there's, there's, there's a change with uh, Muhammad in, in a way that he um, is growing. Yes. He start, he's un, like you told me, we talked before, he's unpopular, but all of a sudden now he's popular. Yes. So there's something changed here. There was a change. There was a change. Uh, they call it the, uh, you know, when, 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 uh, when Muhammad was in Mecca versus when the time that he was in Medina. Mm-hmm. The, the years, the Mecca years, Muhammad's uh, uh, fame was very little. He made very little progress as far as uh, proselytizing people. Mm -hmm. But then by the time the, the, the Medina experience came, Medina is another city somewhat north of uh, Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. At the, by the time the Medina experience came, he moved his entire army, everybody, they moved over there. They actually uh, took Medina. Mm -hmm. There, he suddenly got a lot of supporters. And, and he grew in strength, grew in power and, uh, and was able to achieve a lot of, uh, um, you know, of their expansion through that experience. Um, in uh, Revelation 9, 1, we continue, it says, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. How about we talk about a little about that, the, the bottomless pit here. And, and what is, what is, what is, um, the word bottomless pit in, in, Abuso. in Abuso? I mean, it, it, it is, it's, it doesn't have any foundation. Um, you look, you look at a desert, for example. That's a good example of something that has no foundation. You know, even Jesus talks about, don't build your house on the sand. <laughs> yes. Build it on the rock. That's right. Um, this is, this is what this word is meaning. So it's, it's very interesting. It's almost literally saying something very direct. Um, that this movement is arid. In, in, in a place, well, it says Abusos, you know, it's also geographically fits the, the, uh, to the T. Mm -hmm. Look, it's, um, in, um, in, in most places where the word, uh, abyss is representing the Bible, it talks about, for instance, in Genesis. Oh, well, Genesis that's, chapter that's, one, yeah. the word abyss is used there, uh, uh, referring to Earth's desolate condition before God created vegetation and all that. When God okay. created this world, there was, there was only water. Later on, there was the earth, but it says the earth was without form, without form and, it was and void. void. Yeah. And the, the, the deep, it says all of these, the, the, the word abusos there in mm -hmm. Hebrew is being used and it means formless in mm -hmm. devastation. There was nothing. Right. And, um, and it says that, that the, uh, talk in relationship to the Islamic power, it says that, that the key to the bottomless pit was bottomless pit was given to them. Without bottomless pit, bottomless is abusos. Right. And um, and in um, and uh, for instance, we know in uh, Genesis chapter one. Let me read that verse. It says, okay. "In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form." And the word "form" there is tohu, which means desolate. Mm -hmm. 
and void, and the Hebrew word there is bohu, which means ruin, empty, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the word deep there is tehum, which means abyss. So the earth in its desolate condition is an abyss. Yeah. And the key of the bottomless pit is given to the, to, to the, to this power. And, uh, and he says that, um, uh, uh, these, um, locusts come out of this bottomless pit. But this was and still is the condition of Saudi Arabia, the birthplace of Islam. Yeah. I mean, uh, Saudi Arabia is a wasteland. The entire country is just one vast desert. They don't have places like with evergreen trees and forests mm-hmm. and all that. They do have, they do have um, uh, um, uh, palm trees and stuff, yeah. but, but not, not, you know, they have oases and stuff, but mm-hmm. not large, vast areas that are arid and green and all that. So even um, uh, we know that uh, some historians, Gibbons, for instance, yeah. a famous historian in his book, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, he, I, I'm going to quote him. He says in, uh, in page 315, paragraph two, he says, but in the dreary waste of Arabia, a boundless level of sand is intersected by sharp and naked mountains and the face of the desert without a shade or shelter is scorched by the direct and intense rays of the tropical sun. Instead of refreshing breezes, the winds, particularly from the west, diffuse a noxious and even deadly vapor. The hillocks of sand, which they alternately raise and scatter, are compared to the billows of the ocean, and whole caravans, whole armies have been lost and buried in the whirlwind. So Gibbons tells us this is the condition of, the, of Arabia and fits the description of what the Bible says. So what happens next, Mike? Um, in Revelation 9-2. Chapter two, uh, nine, verse two. It says, "And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the out of the pit, as a smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the reason of the smoke of the pit." Hmm. This is very interesting because smoke. Now we're going to be looking at smoke here a little bit. Um, smoke has a lot of different definitions also in the Bible when it talks of, when we look at the sanctuary. The smoke represents the prayers of the saints going up. Um, these smoke, can, but this is a noxious, something very poisonous. And, and, and it, and it uh, dilutes the atmosphere. And, yeah, and, you can't and, even and breathe. the sun, you, the, it covers the sun. So you, there's, there's no light. And we know that when light is, is taken away, um, in, in Bible prophecy, light represents the truth. The light, that, you know, and and then darkness comes. Uh, this noxious vapor comes and darkens everything. And we know that when truth is taken away, then heresy comes in, and it's darkness. That's right. And and in, but this on this case, it's it's noxious even. It's That's deadly. Right. Well, in the forty times that the Bible uses the word smoke. Uh, most of the time it refers to God's wrath. Yeah. But it also talks about, uh, smoke also talks about falsehood yeah. as well. Like you said, mm-hmm. truth is shielded, covered by the smoke, and, and we see this darkness. Truth is, is covered, yeah. and people are in darkness. That's what it's talking about, and God's wrath. Yeah, and then this is what happened during the Dark Ages when, when Christianity was mixing with paganism. Um, this whole thing happened again, where the light was shining through burlap, if you will, mm. and that burlap was was allow, allowed a little bit of light to get out during you know f- throughout that time of the Dark Ages from you know 538 to 1798. But here, this seems to be like total blackness. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, so that the the, the 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 very existence of the sun is threatened. Yeah, in a sense. Mm-hmm. Um, now, what's the next scene in, in here? The next event is Revelation chapter 9, verse 3. And it talks about the locusts. Hmm. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. You know, Adam Clark, another famous commentary, commentary per, uh, says that the locusts, they are vast hordes of military troops. This description certainly agrees with the historical description of Muslim armies. Hmm. Um, I mean, where do you find where do you find these these large um, populations of of locusts? 
<laughs> what well, I mean, it's well, interesting. I mean, well, it's like the Bible is just literally well, pointing. That's right. Geographically, this is the that's, place. That's, that's the place. Look, locusts are obviously a symbol of the Arab. Yeah. They, they must be. And in this prophecy, four symbols are represented. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to share those one by one here. The first one is locust. Okay. The second one is the scorpion. The third one is the lion. And the fourth one is the horse. Wow. And, and, um, all of these four creatures in their natural habitat are Arabian. The Arabian horse. Famous Arabian horse, yeah. And you, you know go. that, you know that Middle East was, 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 was dotted with lions. Lions are not, people, when you talk about lions, people always talk about Africa. Mm -hmm. But you know that until just recent history, middle of last century, mm -hmm. Middle East still had living lions in it. The, the male lions had a smaller mane than the, than, than the male lions in mm -hmm. Africa, but physically they were the same size. Let me tell you something. I, I've, I've rode Arabian horses. They are an incredibly intense horse. Hot-blooded. Very much. I mean, you have to really hang on. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and, and these guys knew how to ride them. That's right. And so these animals are all symbolically what? The locust, the scorpion. All of them are Arabian. Yeah. Uh, and um, it just fits. And we know it's symbolism because it's all these, it's, it's, it's a mixture of all these animals together. Sure. So we know and, it's and pure even, symbolism. Even uh, Gibbon says in volume five of his book, he says mm -hmm. that the zoology of the hieroglyphic or the symbol, symbolism, they are all Arabian. Even Gibbon, one of these uh, commentators and historians, agrees with this uh, interpretation of the Bible. Wow. And... Um, so, so the Bible employs the, the locust as a symbol. Now we talked about Gibbon, we talked about these historians, but yeah. why don't we read, why don't you read the next verse in, uh, in Judges chapter six, verses three to five. There we read what the Bible says about the Arabs being locusts. Okay, that's, that's good. But now we're doing line upon line, precept line upon, upon precept. Right. Okay. And it says, and so it was when Israel has sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, and that's, that's, there it is, even they came up against them and they encamped against them and destroyed the what? The increase of the earth. Till thou, till thou come unto, unto Gaza. Gaza. And then it, the it, next verse, it says, in, uh, if you continue the next verse, and the, no so sustainers no of Israel, fence. yeah, neither sheep nor ox or ass, for they came up with their cattle and their tents. Ooh, there's a one, there's a good one there, tents. And they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land and to destroy it. And you know the word, the Hebrew word there for grasshopper mm -hmm. is locusts. Locust. And, and when... You and I both have seen documentaries where locusts attack a few, uh, is an area. Oh man! Can people number them? No. They are. They come in vast numbers by the millions. It actually, looks, it looks like a wave. That's right. When you see them moving. You, That's it's, right. It's just moving like 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 an ocean. The, the, you don't want to be in the way of it. <laughs> no. And the fantastic thing is, is that we talked about what the commentators say, but here's the Bible saying it. It's agreeing with it. Bible saying that the Arabs are like locusts mm -hmm. in numbers when they came against Israel. And, um, hmm. and then again, in Judges seven twelve, I can read that for you. It says, and the Midianites and the Amalekites, now if people doubt, here's another text that says it. And all the children of the East lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number as the sand of the sea at the seaside for multitude. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and, and, so now you have two witnesses. You have the two witnesses that the Bible says you have to have to, to make Something that two you can three. build on. Two or, right. or two or three witnesses, all things are established. That's right. We gave so two verse witnesses. All you right need really it. is two. That's right. And they're very strong. That's right. And they are pointing to the correct And we saw that some theologians, very well-known theologians and historians, saw this as well mm -hmm. in history. This is not something that Shabazz and Mike have no, drummed up. No, no, no. This is not what we have. No, this has been in the Christian doctrine part of the Christian doctrine for, for some time now, for at least one and a half century. Right. Uh, Christians have understood this. Uh, uh, and let's move to Revelation uh, chapter 9, verse 4. We're really getting short for time here, and we want to cover the rest tomorrow. 
Okay. Uh, or when we are on next, I'm not sure what the date is, but the next time we're on, we'll cover the rest of the program. Uh, let me read that for you. It says okay. that, uh, verse four, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass, the locusts. Mm -hmm. It was commanded them that they should not That's hurt the, the grass of the, of the earth, neither the green, any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. This is a fascinating prophecy. It is fulfilled to the T, and yeah. I'm going to show the history of it right now. Okay. Okay, let's, let's dive let's into it. that, Mike. Let's go for okay. it. Okay. You know, Abu Bakr, he wrote a letter to the Arabian tribes shortly after he succeeded Muhammad. Muhammad had passed away at the age of 62 mm -hmm. in, 16, in, in the year 632. He passes away. Abu Bakr is chosen to take his place. Abu Bakr is now the head of the Islamic tribes. He sends a letter to his Islamic tribes and gives them this warning. Let me read mm. that. This is, this this is, is amazing. That's right. It says, yes. when you fight, quote, I'm quoting him. When you fight the battles of the Lord, acquit yourselves like men without turning your backs, but let not your victory be stained with the blood of women and children. Destroy no palm trees, nor burn any fields of corn. Cut down no fruit trees, nor do any mischief to cattle, only such as you kill to eat. Hmm. Remember the text said, what did the, what did, let me read the text again. And it was commanded, verse 4, right. that it was commanded them, the locusts, that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which not have the seal of God. So, so here Abu Bakr gives the command, don't destroy any trees, don't destroy any fields, don't just take anything except that which you need to sustain yourselves with. Which is very commendable. That's right. I mean, very you commendable. look at this guy, it's like, it's interesting, but he wasn't always that way, was he? No, I don't think so, but, but very commendable. But very commendable in this, in right. this case. Well, something because, happened. That because God had ordained it. <laughs> That's right. That's God exactly what happened. This. That's right. God had ordained it. <laughs> Before, 600 years earlier in, in the book of Revelation. This is where it was going to That's be. That's right. Yeah. And let me read the rest of the letter dealing with the, those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Okay. And I'm continuing the letter now. And as you go, you will find some religious persons who live retreat, retired in monasteries and, mm. pro, pro, and propose to themselves to serve God that way. Let them alone and neither kill them nor destroy their monasteries. And you will find another sort of people that belong to the synagogue of Satan who have shaven crowns. Who is he talking about shaven crowns? Well, the, in history, the only people that I know that have shaven crowns are, are monks. Monks, uh, uh, Catholic like, monks. And, and, and later on, they stop shaving their head and they just put the little beanie that's right. thing. But that's a symbol of the moon. That's right. That's the pagan symbol of, of the moon god. And that's why they shave their head in reverence for that's the moon. That's right. And, and here he says... But you will find another sort of people that belong to the synagogue of Satan hmm. who have shaven crowns. Be sure you cleave their skulls and give them no quarter till they either turn Mohammedans. In another word, they either turn, become Muslims or pay tribute. So the, the command was, don't destroy any green thing, but go against those that don't have the seal of God. That's what the Bible said. Yeah. But who were those that did not have the seal of God? Abu Bakr says that those are the ones with the cra uh, shaven crowns. Mm -hmm. Kill them. So the people of God who have the seal of God are spared. Let me tell you something. During the Dark Ages, when, when, when the papacy in, the, in Rome was, was going and, and killing everyone that didn't go along with them, God had a bulwark many times. This history proves that God's people were delivered that's right. By the Mohammedans. That's right. In this very interesting. Uh, that's right. Very interesting. And we'll see that more when we talk about the Ottoman Empire. Yes. That, that so so by implication, those who have the seal of God are spared. Those who do not have the seal of God. In this way, it seems to me that the Muslim forces were used by God as a scourge. Yes. As a scourge. Did God ever use any other nation as yeah. a scourge? Babylon too. Babylon. Was Babylon necessarily a, a religious uh, believing terribly, in the true God? Terribly paganistic. I idolaters. Yes. And, but yet God used them to punish Israel for their disloyalty to their God. Yeah. And by default, Nebuchadnezzar wrote a whole chapter, uh, Daniel 4. You know, it, it's, it's amazing. But, you know, here's a Babylonian king. Most likely he'll be in heaven. That's right. So, so if God uses the Babylonians to punish his people and the Persians 
to bless his people yeah. through Cyrus, he could use the Muslims to punish those who do not have the seal of God. That's what the Bible is saying. I didn't say that. You didn't say that. We're no. just saying what the Bible said. Yes. Right. Well, friends, well, we have come to the end of another program and uh, we really enjoyed this time with you and we hope that you've enjoyed it and that you will tune in again and, and uh, watch the, the future programs that we have, uh, we are preparing for you. May God bless you and we'll see you again soon.